Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Life Inner Show. I am your host, Jason Wojo, and on the Life Inner Show, we help people work less, make more, and create a life they absolutely love. I am joined by Polish Peter, my co-host in this episode. Welcome to the show, Peter. Well, thank you for having me on there. I'm, I'm always here, so it's all good. <laughs> You're always here. Like, it's, it's just normal. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Well, listen, dude, we have a great episode ahead of us. We have Mike Wagner, who, uh, for, for those of you who don't know, uh, I've known, we, well, actually, we both got to know Mike several years ago uh, at a Life Inner event in Rochester, and it's been really cool. He has an awesome story. And like many people, and me especially, actually, he, he, when, I'm, when uh, I listened to uh, him speak and tell me a story way back when, he, I, I had so many uh, similarities to my own story that I, I wanted other people to share this. Uh, I wanted him to share it and other people hear it. Yeah. And I'm really excited about this particular episode because of the fact that a lot of people that even that I know or through the life on there, they go in through a typical channels, education, give degrees, then they end up with student loans and all that kind of stuff. Right. And how do you transition? And what I like about Mike, what he shares on this particular episode, I want you to listen closely because he shares little nuggets that has allowed him to make that transition from the job to being a self, you know, employed entrepreneur and all that kind of stuff. And that there's a mindset shift that happens and all that kind of stuff. And, and that's a really cool thing to actually know, you know. Absolutely, man. He talks about some real, really valuable uh, tips and techniques and what worked for him to get out of that nine to five and go into, uh, in his case, self-storage full time. So I'm excited to go uh, and listen to that interview. Let's go ahead and run to it right now. Hey, Mike, what's up, man? Welcome to Life Inner Show. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, Wojo, man. I'm glad to be here. Peter, it's, it's good to see you as always, man. Yeah, same here, man. It's good to have somebody with a good looking hair. <laughs> is this how we're going to start the episode is just like the hair jokes okay sure. i get it <laughs> i'm going to show up on one of these with a wig by the way one of these times and you guys are just going to like be just eat your heart out in jealousy and and, and uh, envy okay so this audience just heard that so now you have to own up now to i it. will do it but you're gonna have to go to the youtube channel and check it out all right so listen mike dude i gotta tell you um I've, I've heard, you know, you and I have had a chance to talk recently and even as early as, was it, was it a year ago or two years ago that we did the, the live event in Rochester? I, I think it was about a year and a half ago now. Okay, yeah. man. So, so a year and a half ago. Um, and prior to that, like I had kind of heard rumblings of this guy named like Mike Wagner, who has this great story, who's, who's in self storage and now he's teaching other people to do it and he's creating an incredible life for himself. Um, and then as we've gotten to know each other more, I've heard more about the story. And I'll tell you, it's, it's, I love it. And it's not only a, a phenomenal example of like what can happen when you, when you take these principles, apply them and, and then make something happen, but also like for other people who I know now that you're helping do this. Um, and I, I don't want to get too far into that. We're gonna, I think, you know, Mike, we definitely got to have you back for another episode to talk about the details of your storage business, but like walk us through like what, like, let's I want to, I want the, the audience to get to know you more. Um, cause this, this, this wasn't always you, right? You started from a very different place. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, I'll give you a bit on the, on the, uh, historical background and then segue into kind of my, my life and air journey, if that's all right. I, um, I went to school to be a physical therapist and, uh, I love being a therapist. It was six and a half years of school, a quarter million dollars in, invested into my education. And the act of performing therapy and helping grandma walk again after surgery or stroke or whatever it is, uh, or whatever it was, was incredibly rewarding to me. Um, and yet something fell off back then. It, it, it was almost as soon as I started practicing, I enjoyed the, the act of therapy but um, I just felt like, like I had jumped through all the hoops that society told me to, right? I had gone to school. I had got good, good grades. I got three degrees. And when I quote unquote succeeded, it didn't feel like I thought it was going to. Um, I kind of, I guess disillusioned is the best word. I, I had done all the things I was quote unquote supposed to do. And it didn't feel like I thought it was going to. Um, and this was, this was going back probably to, well, I graduated school in 2006. And you got, you got, so you actually got a job as a physical therapist after school? 
I did. Yep. I, uh, so I went to school for six and a half years. I practiced for a grand total of about four. So, uh, the, the all true accurate joke is that I almost made my money back on my education. <laughs> dude. So I, I'm listening to you, Peter, you know what I'm thinking right now too. I'm like, dude, this yeah. guy is like another me. Like I right. now, That's what now I was but, just but you're say. smarter than me because I spent 15 Yo, years in school. <laughs> like, yeah. And I got four degrees. So like you're the, clearly the, the sharper one of the two of us here. So, okay. So you, so you get into this first job and like, so, so you, so you're enjoying the, the hands-on part of it, but there's, there's a whole other part that didn't feel right to you. Like what, what was that? What, 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 what didn't, what fell off? Yeah. It, you know, for me, I think it was, it was this punch in the clock kind of thing. It was this, this lack of autonomy where I wasn't in control of my own time. Mm. Right. Um, and it really, it all came to a head. So, uh, when I started practicing, there was the excitement. And for several years, that's what, uh, that's what allowed me to get to the four year mark as a therapist. Um, but the truth is, I knew from the beginning that I wanted to, at the very least, supplement my income with other things like real estate investing. So within six weeks of graduating, I had bought my first duplex. Um, and I, I started down the path of becoming a landlord and, and did that for several years before I transitioned to my current strategy. Um, but it, you know, what happened was as time went by, I realized that I wasn't being true to myself. I was just punching the clock. I was just going through the motions day in and day out. And, and I don't want to paint this picture that I was, uh, you know, facing some crippling depression and I was in the fetal position. Like life was pretty good. Like I, I had married the, the girl of my dreams. We've been together. Geez. Now over 20 years, if you can believe that. Um, Dude, you know, would you get have, married at like five years old? Like what the heck? Well, I said we've been together. We've only been okay. together for 11, we, but we dated for close to 10 before that. We okay. were high school sweethearts. Um, I was 17 and she was 15 when, when we started dating. So, Dude, that's amazing, man. Because you look, yeah, wow. you're super young, man. Good for you, dude. You'd re- wow. It's the lighting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the Bojo's excuse. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, but so all kidding aside, like I I just like, I did all the things that society said I should do to be quote unquote happy. Mm -hmm. And, and I wasn't not, I wasn't unhappy. I just knew there had to be more. And so, um, I started looking into this real estate thing and this was pre life and air. So, uh, I was still to some extent subscribing to the more is better. And, Mm -hmm. and, and I was holding this, this, financial finish line um, out there as my key to success. Um, and that drove me to achieve some good success, but it was a, a race I ultimately learned I couldn't win. And we'll probably talk more about that later. But long story short, uh, I knew something had to change when my wife and I were on vacation in Costa Rica. And back then what we did with our, we, we took vacations. We no longer do. Now we travel. And the reason I make that distinction is because the word vacation means vacate. And back then I truly had to vacate my everyday life as a therapist in order to experience my highest levels of happiness. And we were down in Costa Rica. It was a dream, like pure bliss, whatever your perfect vacation is. That's what this was for us. I was walking on the beach with the ocean waves crashing on my ankles. The sun was shining. I was drinking a cold beer. My wife was sunbathing down the the, down the other end of the beach. I was considering taking a surfing lesson. Like it was awesome, like pure bliss. And then in that moment, that's when it happened. Like it occurred to me that 48 hours later, I was going to be thrown back into my real world of not only the nine to five as a therapist, but also chasing the rents as a landlord because, uh, I wasn't cut out to be a landlord. We'll say that. Uh, so I was, um, it occurred to me in that moment that the thing that was off in my life is I had set it up, not on purpose. I had done what people told me I was supposed to, but I had unintentionally set it up in a way where I had to escape my day-to-day life to be my happiest. All right. I think that's a common denominator from a lot of entrepreneurs who actually end up in life on there. You know, and some of those who actually change their careers because you know that something is off. And I think this is a really important thing that you mentioned about the vacate, vacate, right? And what it meant for you, because I think that's like one of those moments that people kind of like experience. So 
you've experienced this, you got home, did anything change after or what happened next? Yeah. So this was just to set the timeline. This was 2011 and, and my wife and I came home and, and I vowed that I was going to do something different. The, the physical therapy, um, it was paying our bills, but it wasn't filling me up. Um, and it was, it was to the point where it was impacting my ability to be the husband I wanted to be. We didn't have kids at the time, but it just, it, it was to the point where something had to change. I, I knew that. And so I decided I was going to find a better way. And that's ultimately uh, when I started to explore and soon thereafter purchase my first storage facility, um, which again, we can talk about at another time, but um, it was that first storage facility that I look back on with extreme gratitude as one, it's, it's the investment that got me out of my nine to five, but looking back far more importantly, it's, it's the investment that allowed me to create space in my life for things like life and air. And the journey that I've been on since finding life and air has been, I mean, words can't do justice to how grateful I am for being exposed to the life and air organization and the concepts and, and everything that I've experienced since then. I mean, there's not a, I'm not exaggerating when I say there's not an aspect of my life that hasn't been impacted in a hugely beneficial way because of my involvement with this organization. So, uh, you know, I'm happy to share as many details as, as you guys think your audience would be interested in hearing, but it's been, uh, it's been an awesome ride. I'll say that. Man, I love that. Tell me why, you know, so, so you had this moment, you had this epiphany. And by the way, I, I, like Peter said, I, I do, I love that how you really recognize the difference between having a life you don't need to take a vacation from and then deliberately having to escape your life. And so do you think this is something that a lot of people have like this realization? Like, do you think, you know, cause I, I had the same thing too. Like I was literally in my first month of work and I realized like this cannot be all that is meant for life. Like I, I, I hated somebody else controlling my life, my schedule, how much I made, what I had to work, all this stuff. Same as you. Um, do you think other people have that same realization? You know, far be it for me to put words in other people's mouths, but you know, if you put me on the spot to answer that question, I would say absolutely. And, and what tears me apart, like I, few things bother me as much as when folks have that realization and don't have the support or the resources or the belief system, most, probably most accurately, uh, to feel like they have any power to change it. That is uh, what the, the song I've been preaching since, since Life and Air provided me with that, let's call it a roadmap to being able to make those changes, right? It, mm -hmm. it, it drives me crazy when I hear people uh, look at kind of the progress I've made both professionally and personally since becoming involved with Life and Air and, and oh, it must be nice. And it's like, well, no, you don't get it. Like, you got to start down the path first and then those things change. They think that, uh, you know, I, I, oftentimes I think people um, see progress and think that it's not available to them because they're not in a position to tap into it yet. And I'm like, well, well, no, you've got to start, start the journey. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy where, where one feeds off the other. And, and it's this upward spiral of, I call it the upward spiral of awesomeness. <laughs> right. I mean, just like, think about it. Babies got to learn, start to walking, right? At some point, it's not like you, all of a sudden a baby stands up and just walks right away. So there is that point where you have to go through those first steps. One thing that I, um, you didn't mention, I'm wondering if that was in there for you as well, because in order for you to take those steps, I feel like there's got to be some courage in there too, right? Because you got family, right? I don't know. Do you have kids already at that time? I did not at the time, but that is an awesome question. I'm glad you brought it up because um, the way I segued out of my nine to five and into storage was... Um, unique to say the least. It's not necessarily uh, what I recommend for folks and, and uh, not the way I would advise many people to do it, though for some it might be the best route. And essentially what I did is I quit that relatively good paying job, right? We we're making $70,000, $75,000 a year as a therapist to buy a storage facility that was losing $2,000 a month. So 
if you do the math, I had a hundred thousand dollar pay cut essentially overnight. I mean, I, I quit that job the day before I closed on that first facility and the general consensus is, well, Mike's just crazy, right? Well, well yeah. and he has this crazy high tolerance for risk, but the truth is it was just how I, uh, the lens that I viewed my situation through is just different than people on the outside looking in. I knew that the greater risk was spending the very finite amount of time that I have on this earth doing something that didn't fulfill me, right? And so the risk of staying in my nine to five job was far greater than any financial fallout that was going to happen by me taking this, this quote unquote crazy risk. Now, to your point, I didn't have kids at the time and we lived very modestly. My, my wife kept her job for a couple of years until we had our first son after I quit, um, it, which was clearly beneficial to us far beyond the financial support, her faith in my ability to make this stuff up as I went and figure it out was in, you know, I'm, I'm eternally grateful to her for that. Um, and I think it's paid off for, for our family. Um, but I didn't have kids at the time. We lived in a modest house. Our bills were paid with, we, we could cover the bills even when I took that big pay cut, at least for eight months, right? So I had somewhat of a runway. Um, and that just kind of lends credence to that life and error principle of, um, you know, when you're financially prudent, when stage two is met, mm -hmm. it opens you up to opportunities that aren't available if you're struggling to make ends meet each and every month, right? Having that little nest egg, having a low stage two income is the reason I was able to pursue storage to begin with. Right. Yeah, dude, I love that. And I also love Peter, what you said about, you know, uh, it's, it's these baby steps. You know, I heard someone say once it's, it's the sequence is crawl, walk, run, win gold medals. And yet so many people are seeing you, Mike, now as someone like, Oh, well, easy for him to say, uh, he's, you know, he has all this, he's done all this, he had, but you started from somewhere just like everybody else starts from somewhere. Um, and so it's so, it's so crazy how people forget that picture, you know, whether we're talking about, you know, anyone like a, like anybody who's successful in any endeavor, yeah. like it, they didn't just start like that. And, and so, but people, it's so bizarre how they kind of look at that end result without realizing what went through that. And you had, I mean, and I don't, I don't know how much you feel comfortable talking about in the podcast, but you had some personal challenges and things that you went through um, as you, as you kind of went through this too, right? Like you, you faced plenty of adversity. What was that like? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I want to just maybe take a step back and explain that. So what I've described so far, quitting the job and going through storage, that was, that was pre life and air. And, and, um, before I got involved and, and though the changes that happened during that time frame before I was introduced to life and air were, were pretty dramatic. And if you had asked me back then, I'd be like, man, this, this degree of change and this rate of change in our life is insane. There's no way it could accelerate from here. <laughs> and then I was introduced to life and air. And over time I was uh, kind of increased my, my involvement as far as, uh, whether I was just stealing the concepts from the book or uh, having my uncle who introduced me to Life and Air uh, kind of be my, my, uh, my free coach and mentor until I stepped up to the titanium level membership that I'm in now. But looking back, the rate probably quadrupled once I got serious about applying the life and error principles to my life, right? So um, to answer your question more directly, I'm, I'm willing to share every and anything, uh, progress, transitions, adversity that I've, that I've endured. Um, and, and maybe I, we don't have time to go into it all, but maybe as one example, I will tell you that uh, my involvement in Life and Air is the thing that allowed me to first identify one of my biggest challenges. I truly didn't know what anxiety was, much less think that I had any issues with it right? I was, I thought anxiety was what people who weren't good at handling stress did to themselves, right? Like, and I know that makes me sound like an insensitive jerk. I can say it now because I now have a much better understanding of it, but 
I didn't realize I was struggling with anxiety and, and I've, I've since changed. Uh, I no longer struggle with it. I occasionally experience it, but it's very different. Life and Air taught me that our words matter. And so I make sure to uh, apply the right words to my experiences. But beyond that, I also came to the realization that I was medicating that anxiety. Uh, I was self-medicating it with alcohol. Um, I wasn't I wasn't your stereotypical uh, alcoholic by any stretch. I Well, let me back up. I might have been in high school and college a little bit. I always just thought I liked to party, but having this new, uh, let's see, awareness, let's call it, that Life and Air helped me find, I was able to look back and I realized from as when I started drinking in high school all the way through college, it was to address anxiety and social anxiety and and those types of things. And so when I got into life and air, what the very short version of what I'm, I'm going to oversimplify this, but what I think happened is uh, I was already on a good financial trajectory. I had a boatload of debt and I didn't realize how much that debt was affecting me. Um, that's a different story. Um, but as far as this personal uh, challenge with anxiety, what, what happened is I realized that by shifting my mindset from more is better and, and really allowing the life and air concepts to, uh, to infiltrate my life and, and I had the time and the space in my world to work on me, right? And, and because of that, I was able to do some of this deep inside work that makes me sound like a hippie, but I guess I, I fit that look pretty well. You good have right the hair, now. yeah. <laughs> um, so now that explains a lot right there. That's right. <laughs> um, but it, it was, had I not had, had life and air and my coach in life and air not helped me and supported me on that journey, I probably would have had still had my head in the sand around that anxiety, maybe still needing to medicate it. I've, I haven't had a drink in, in probably two and a half years. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't say that I quit drinking. I just stopped. Um, but one of the things that, that Life and Air helped me understand this is that our beliefs, our worldly beliefs, I'll say, are only true for as long as we believe them. So quick example is I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt the belief I held uh, because I struggled with it for years. I white knuckled my drinking for years because I knew the level of drinking from college was not socially acceptable for a 30, 32, 35 year old. Right. And so I dialed it back like the world does, but my relationship with it still wasn't healthy. And so I white knuckled it to where it was just a, uh, a drink or two a night. And I knew the belief I held was that I had two choices. I could either keep drink, drinking, white knuckling it, wasting all that energy to keep it appropriate or I could deprive myself and live this stale, boring life of deprivation. And those were the only two options. Uh, my coach, Chuck, in Life and Air, taught me the concept that, well, his question for me is, why are you pretending there's only two choices? And I'm like, because those are the two choices, man. <laughs> those are them. And he said, he said, well, what if there's a third better choice? And that, I'm getting goosebumps just saying that because it – it changed the way I thought about everything. And now I just decided two and a half years ago, maybe a little more closer to three years, I guess. Um, I decided that there was a third better option. And that was that I was fully capable of stopping drinking effortlessly and gracefully and my life would get better. And over the last three years, that's proven to be true. So had I not been willing to change my belief, and allow Chuck to challenge him the way he did. And he's done that in basically every realm of my life. Um, I'd probably still be the same guy I was three years ago, as opposed to the one who's experienced some incredible growth as a result of being open to these kinds mm -hmm. of changes, if that makes sense. Yeah. I want to pause for a minute because I think what you said here is really important. I want the audience to get this about having the third choice. Because I think a lot of times what happens when people feel stuck in their life or where they have this anxiety, like what you discussed, right? They get stuck in that's either this or that. And neither one of them are really the best kind of a choices. And when you consider that what if there's a third choice, now it gives you this whole another world where you can 
feel a lot, you know, um, easier about making a choice, right? There is something that shifts in that. And I think what you said is it applies to every single big decision or any kind of decision that you now do in life and asking yourself, there's like a tough decision that you have to make. You ask yourself, oh, what if there's a third option? Am I right about that? Absolutely. And, yeah. and, and I'll go so far as to say, I now use an either or decision as a red flag. Uh, that's a sign to me that I'm going back to my old ways. And it's not, it's not, you know, it's not a bad thing. It's not, if people are thinking in an either or uh, framework, it's not that they're bad people are doing something wrong. That's just how we're conditioned. Right. And so it's, that's why I'm so passionate about uh, whether it's life and air or other um, supporting environments that that counterbalance the prevailing message that our quote unquote society would have us uh, believe, right? Because uh, it's very easy to be un unconsciously influenced, right? Oh yeah. You talk about a diet, right? The things you put in your body contribute to how either healthy or unhealthy you are. Well, the same is true for the media you consume or the, the videos you watch, the conversations you have, right? I'm going to feel very different for the rest of the day after having spent this time with you guys talking about this stuff than I would if I watched CNN or Fox or any news outlet for the next 60 minutes, right? Um, and, and we need to be conscious of that. Um, that's why I'm, you know, I, I, I feel the need to say that I don't get compensated for selling life in there. I just do it because I love it. Like the, the, I will say to close the loop on that last story about the, the anxiety and the self-medication, I can remember vividly sitting with my friend about two years ago. It was probably six to nine months after I stopped drinking my friend. And I have a great group of friends. We've all been friends since kindergarten and I was sitting with him at the age of 35 or 36. I'd known him for 30 years. And I said, dude, Zach, do you realize that this is the first time I've been comfortable enough in my own skin to sit and hang with you without a beer in my hand? Like, that's all we did as, as friends. Even if it was just a beer or two, we weren't getting drunk. We weren't going crazy, but we were all taking the edge off. Um, and some of them are doing that, and it's not an issue. Their relationship with alcohol is fine. Mine was not. So I truly credit the journey I've been on with Life and Air as bringing me to a place for the first time in my life where I am completely comfortable in my own skin. Uh, I have no problem being vulnerable or authentic, uh, flaws and all, I'll share them. Whereas before, my entire self-worth was based on what people thought of me, right? It wasn't a God-given value that I had. It was and extrinsically, you know, I was only as good as my last race results, or I was only as good as my last test grade or my last investment success, right? None of it was intrinsic. And life and air has taught me that my worth is God given. And it's my obligation, my welcome obligation and responsibility to share my story flaws and all. And, and so that's, that's part of, you know, why I'm here talking to you guys today. Man, well, I love, um, and the reason I wanted to ask you about the, because I, I knew about the anxiety and the drinking, we had spoken about it previously um, quite a while ago. And I wanted to bring that up because we're, we, everyone listening right now may be struggling with their own version of some, something that has held them back, some challenge, some issue, some, 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 something that's going on that, that is, that is, that is um, not helping them. And yet here you are and you still found a way to overcome it. You still worked through it. You still were able to achieve the things you want to and have achieved despite that. And so um, I really wanted you to share that because I think it's inspirational to people that could be, you know, and, and listen, these, and the, the challenges that people could have, it could be personal. It could be, maybe you don't have uh, the support around you. Maybe you think you don't have the education. Maybe you have other, other challenges uh, or, or you struggle with, with, depression or, or whatever it is, like everybody has something, everybody. And so as you're able to acknowledge that and then move past it, like you have, um, the other side, you know, the, awaits, uh, the, 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 the end result is, is there for you. Um, and now you mentioned your friends, man. And actually I wanted to ask you about that. 
did you have, as you're making this transition from your full-time job into, into real estate and like were your friends, like, that's awesome, man. Like, cool. Or were they like, dude, you've lost your mind. Like, did you have the support there? Um, and did, and what was that like for you? Yeah. I, you know, I think, um, I don't, I, I don't know either way. It, it, I didn't have a lot of negativity. I mean, my friends and my family were supportive, but they still couldn't help maybe convey some genuine concern. <laughs> uh, right. But, um, it, you know, the truth is I needed an organization like life and air to support me along the way, simply because, um, what I was doing was so quote unquote crazy to the rest of the world. So they weren't outwardly negative per se, uh, but they also weren't, overly supportive. Um, it, it, and the kinds of transition that I was undergoing or, or the kinds of changes I was trying to make in my life at the rate I wanted to make them, I needed real support, not like rooting from the sidelines kind of thing. Like I needed help. Like let's roll up our sleeves and figure out wh what between here is slowing me down and let's attack it. And I've, I've got one buddy who, um, he and I have a bit of that relationship, but it's, it's disjointed and, and we both have our lives uh, keeping us busy and he's not, um, I, I don't want to say this the wrong way. I, I love, I give the guy my shirt off, uh, the shirt off my back and he would do the same for me. And at the same time, our level of awareness around what's possible for each of us is just very different. And so I felt like, as though he was supportive of me, oftentimes I was the one forging the path and leading the way and bringing him along. Like, hey man, think about it this way. And it just, it felt like, um, I, I don't know how to say, I, I wanted someone to walk beside me, not in front of me or behind me, which is sometimes where I felt I was stuck. And, and by getting a coach and, and then the group as a whole, uh, I feel like I, that's where I found that. Got it. One, you know. thing, one thing I want to touch on, just uh, forgive me, but regarding the friends thing, uh, best group of five guy friends, they were all in my wedding. We've been friends literally since kindergarten, 30 years. And the thing I said at my first life in air retreat at the end of the three days is I addressed the group and I said, listen, I'm not discounting the love that my friends have for me and that I have for them but I've known them for 30 years and the 30 people in this room know more about me, the real me than those friends that I've had for 30 years do. That's the kind of environment that life Nair created for me. And it was, I mean, I, I will be eternally grateful for that. That's for sure. Man, dude, that's awesome. And you know, I, we've had, we've heard people say, um, this is actually Keith and Shannon French who said, you know, life in here is like the family you wish you had. Um, yeah. cause, and now you are, you are fairly fortunate. Uh, it sounds like in having some really good friends, we do talk with people who like, tr quite frankly, either a number of things, either one, they don't have any support. Um, and it's neutral or sometimes even worse, people are negative and saying like, you know, have you lost your mind? Like, what are you, what are you thinking? Like, you know, you have this safe, secure job, you, you're making this money. Like, what do you, and, and, you know, sometimes people have kids and they're like, well, what, what about your kids? And you, and they'll use their kids against them and to inspire fear in, in making those decisions. And so, so it's, it's good to help. It's really good to hear that, that, that wasn't too much of an issue for you. Bring us back. And by the way, as you're making this transition, so, so you went from the job into rentals and then the rentals into the storage, that's a tremendous, I mean, so you didn't just reinvent yourself once you really did it twice. And so, how do you like, especially with somebody who had some anxiety, how did you, I mean, man, that, that sounds anxiety provoking. Like, how did you actually make this happen? Yeah. Well, um, you know what it can't, all of our decisions, right. We, we, we know that all of our decisions are either made to escape pain or approach pleasure. Right. And, and so when I made the transition from a day job to, landlording, I was landlording in the evenings and weekends, right? So that wasn't so, so dramatic, if you will. Um, it did add a lot to my plate. And I've, I've come to realize that part of the anxiety I 
have experienced in the past is a result of um, my own unintentional doing, right? I, I'm an achiever. And so that anxiety was always, uh, it, it, listen, there were benefits to it. I talked about um, deriving my wealth from extrinsic factors. Well, that led me to achieve a lot of really cool stuff, right? I've run countless marathons, full distance, Ironman triathlons, like, because I needed to impress people. That's clearly not healthy. But at the same time, there were benefits, right? I, I derived satisfaction from doing those things. Um, and so over time, what I came to realize is that that I just need to weigh the cost and benefits of all my decisions. Before it was just, hey, take on something, achieve it, and you'll feel good about it. What I didn't account for was the negative side or the cost associated with those decisions. And so um, as time's gone by, I've become very much more intentional about how I take on deals. To directly answer your question, that transition into storage, um, it was a dramatic shift in, you know, by leaving the job and going there. But I had spent four years learning a skill set, real estate investing, where all the same fundamentals apply to storage. So it wasn't this crazy pivot. It was just a, a course correction more than anything else. Right? right. It was, I knew I wanted out of my job. Real estate is the answer. I knew that. So I explored landlording. I got up to 31 apartments. I flipped a house or two, but or tried to, and then ended up being a landlord on those ones too. Um, right. So long story short, I learned, I wasn't getting where I wanted to go fast enough. I didn't abort mission, burn everything down and start fresh. I just took the skills that I had learned and applied them to a different asset class. So, so, so I love that, man. So it was more of an evolution than a, than a, than a, than a, than a complete like remodel um, or start from scratch. And so for people listening, that are wanting to start making these transitions for themselves, what is your advice? Like, so, so I know first, of course, you, you, I mean, let's assume that they have some degree of faith, some degree of hope. And, and mainly that's because they've seen people succeed. Maybe they haven't developed their skill sets yet. What are some of the first things people can do if they're finding themselves in, in any situation, whether what, maybe whether we're talking somebody who's in a full-time job who wants to get out of that job or, Maybe it's someone who's in rentals who wants to get into storage. I mean, I guess anybody who's ready for a pivot, have you, have you ever helped anybody through that? Or do you have any advice for someone in that situation? Yeah. And, and so I'll make one, one additional assumption. Uh, this needs to be number one. And then I'll skip past it because I know that Life and Air does a lot to empower people to do this. But clearly having a, a well-defined vision in writing is step number one. Without that, um, that's, that's the roadmap. There, there's, you can't win a race if you don't know where the finish line is, right? And so um, that's number one. Once people have that, one key concept that I like to share with folks who are looking to make a pivot is that, listen, we don't want to burn the house down. What your experiences, your skills, everything you have, the resources that you might not even acknowledge, let's take an inventory of those, right? And, and they're all valuable moving forward. So if you've ever read The Big Leap, um, one of the concepts he talks about are the zone of excellence and the zone of genius. And, you know, so the zone of excellence is where I think most of America stops, where they get the bills paid maybe, and they work to put food on the plate. They, they're good enough to do something to, to impress people enough to compensate them for those efforts, and it pays their bills. Um, that's stopping there I, I think is stopping short of true fulfillment and that's usually when people want to pivot right and so what I always encourage people to do is one identify the zone of genius right that's the thing that fires you up whatever it is for me it's conversations like this it's masterminding it's coaching it's it's synergy and collaboration it's the magic that we experience at life and air retreats mm -hmm. that's my zone of of genius not and that doesn't isn't that sounds more arrogant than it is. It's not that I'm a genius at it. It's the environment where I'm able to tap into my highest genius, right? And so um, if people can identify that, 
in a perfect world, we'd just be able to jump from zone of excellence and flip over to zone of genius and we'd be happy, uh, happy ever after, right? But the truth is there's a transition and an evolution to use your word, Wojo. And the way I encourage people to make that transition is to always view the time they spend in their zone of excellence as it should fulfill one of two things. It should either give them skills that will allow them to transition into their zone of genius, or it should fund time in their zone of genius. So the difference, the, the idea being, I went out and I bought a bunch of rentals and apartments, and that gave me skills that I could then transition into the world of storage, which opened up my opportunities for coaching. Sometimes that's not always possible. You might just need to sweep floors. Now, if that's the case, that's where the four st stages of financial prosperity come in. You sweep floors so good, maybe you do it in 32 hours a week instead of 40, and that buys you an extra eight hours to explore your zone of genius and start to find ways in a perfect world to monetize the zone of genius. Because then, it, then you can't lose. You're spending all your time doing the thing that fills your tank and you're getting paid for it. And because you're doing the thing that lights you up, you're going to do it so well that you're going to get paid absurd amounts of money to do it, thereby just opening up the next level, right? There's no finish line. It's always just what's next. There's an extra layer to peel back in our personal development, in our quest to have the greatest impact. So um, that was a really long-winded answer to your question. I hope I at least touched, at least touched on it. No, man, that, that was awesome. And I, I actually love that, you know, so it's this, this evolution from the, from the zone of excellence to genius. Is there any, uh, how do people get into that zone of excellence? What if they're not even there yet? So, um, the best way to figure it out is to have someone coach you through it. Right. Um, and that's part of the, the vision crafting process that life and air takes people through, um, that sadly, uh, some people are slow to buy into. I know many folks who have come into life and air and then resisted that writing the vision element. And it's so critically important. I just want to hit them with a two by four, but, um, you know, there's also an element of, uh, allowing a coach being coachable to help you identify it, not to impart their zone of genius on you. Right. But to uh, people that have gone through it, people that have walked the path. So maybe it's not even a coach. Maybe it's just someone who's further along their life and their journey than, than you are. Um, they've walked the path. They can help guide you. You've got to do the hard work, but asking questions like what gives you goosebumps? Everybody has a zone of genius and everybody can identify it. They just don't always know how to articulate it. And they need the, they need someone just to help them one, really understand what it is. And then two, help them remember a time when they were tapped into it. And then it's just a matter of creating a plan to spend more time there. And then it becomes that, that upward spiral of awesomeness that I talk about. So that you're in your, so you could even go from, I mean, I mean, and I'm guessing at each level of, of the, your excellence or genius zone, like you said, it's not like you just get, like you can continually refine it and continually evolve. And so you're getting deeper and deeper and deeper into whatever zone it is into, in, in getting closer to your, your true, like what absolutely every moment of your day you love and you, you absolutely, you know, uh, you get to do. I mean, it's just like you have to pinch yourself to, to the point of believing this is even real. Um, what does, speaking of that, man, what does life look like for you now? Like, and actually I, I spoke with you a couple of weeks ago and you were like on an RV trip and you're like, yeah, we just got back. We just did this other trip and we're going on another one. Like, what is, what are some of the things that like fire you up and like, and, and how have you arranged your life uh, to, to its maximum benefit? Yeah, man, I would be remiss to not say that single-handedly the, the, the best part of my life right now is um, the fact that I'm able to maintain my priorities in the right order, keeping first things first, right? My faith and my family, you can see my, my three kids behind me there. They are number one. And, and that's part of my journey that we didn't talk about, but um, uh, my quest to become a better father and a husband ha has been uh, facilitated by the journey I've been on with life and air for the last several years. Um, 
but from a nuts and bolts day-to-day -day standpoint, our life is incredible. Gratitude, I can't express enough gratitude for the life we have. You mentioned we just came back from a, a two-week camping trip down south. We were home for like four days and we, we were home for like two days and we looked at it and we're like, why'd we come home? And so we just jumped back in the camper and went out for another four days. Um, we, you know, everything that's going on with the virus has put a little wrench in our, in our plans. We were supposed to be in Texas for the entire month of August. Um, we, even with Corona, anticipate traveling between five and six months this year between a combination of taking our camper. We're, we're kind of trending toward this nomadic lifestyle. We've been forced to homeschool like everybody else. And we've been toying with the idea for some time. And uh, this has, this, this, the silver lining of this whole Corona thing has given us uh, maybe the realization that, that we can do that. We, it, it's possible, right? And, mm -hmm. And that just goes to show you no matter how quote unquote evolved someone who might be further down their life and their journey is, I still fall victim to the same limiting beliefs and think that I'm not capable of X, Y, Z until we're forced to recognize that, Hey, maybe you are capable of it. Right. And so we're doing that. We'll be, um, all over the country, um, uh, between now and the end of the year, now that we've started moving again. Um, and we'll top out five to six months and I can, I can do all my work, whether it's storage related, that only takes five to eight hours a week for all three of my facilities that I own now. Um, and then I coach the, the single best thing that I can use to convey uh, what my life looks like is that every morning, everything I do, and I use the term everything loosely, I, yes, I have to mow the lawn because I enjoy it. And to that point, everything's a get to, right? It doesn't matter what it is you do to make money. At some point, regardless of how much you enjoy it, if it becomes a have to, because you need to make money to pay bills, everybody wants to be a ski bum, right? Or, you know, when they're, when they're in a teenager, either a ski bum or a surf bum, we'll talk to the guy 10 years later who's teaching bunny lessons he got his dream job as being a, a ski instructor in Vail, Colorado, but since he has to do it, the love is stolen out of that activity, right? And so everything I do is to try to structure my life so that my days are increasingly in the get to realm. And I'm happy to report, I hope it doesn't come off as immodest, but I'm basically to the point where the have to's have been eliminated. Man, and that is an awesome place to be. I know exactly what you're talking about, man. And uh, it, it's just, it's such a different feeling. And so, you know, um, I love hearing about your success, man. I absolutely, um, you're, you're, you're such a great model and, you've, and, and you incorporate so many parts of your story that people can relate to. I think people really, really can look to you as someone who's, who's made it happen and who's, who's accomplished these things. And I, and I really want to thank you for sharing everything on, on the Life Inner Show. If someone's looking to learn more about you or, or what you're doing, where's the best place to do that? Yeah, I would uh, probably refer them to one of two places, either just my website to kind of get an overview of what we do. That's thestoragerebellion.com. Uh, or if they have an interest in, in really digging into the storage stuff more specifically, uh, if you just tack on members dot before that website, so it's members dot thestoragerebellion.com, uh, I host a, a free community. Um, of basically like-minded people who want to explore whether or not storage is a vehicle that can help them achieve the kind of life that, that would make them feel fulfilled. Man, I love it. And I actually, speaking of vehicle, I remember what you once telling me, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, correct me if I said it wrong, but you said like the vision is the road and for you, storage was the vehicle to get that. And so, man, I, I love that. And for, and for somebody else, it could be something else, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's awesome in concept and application. And I really want to thank you, man. And by the way, I'm in, I'm in that community as well. And, and you guys, you have something special going on there. I really want to thank you uh, for, for sharing your story here. Uh, very grateful for it. And also, uh, Peter, we have to ha get Mike back on again and talk specific to storage because I think, you know, you probably raised some, a yeah. lot of questions in our listeners, Mike, of like, what, tell me more about this. And so we're gonna have to do that episode. And so thanks for being on the show, man. This has been incredible. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate the opportunity and I appreciate everything you, Peter, uh, Steve Cook, the entire life organization. I appreciate it more than I can say. 
Awesome, man. Thanks, dude. Awesome. Man, that was awesome. I got to tell you, when I was listening to him talk about his story, I could not help but think about my own story, like, you know, going from the full-time job to real estate investing. Now, he he chose something a little bit different. Like, I never really went the full-scale rental approach. I was more into the flipping. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I loved was what he talked about is, is even after he made that transition, he realized even that wasn't exactly what he wanted. And then he found um, a way to kind of evolve again. Um, and I... I, I you know, I used the word kind of reinvent, but he really didn't reinvent. He kind of corrected me there a little bit. He said, I kind of evolved, like, because he took a lot of the skills and a lot of the things that he had learned in the rental business and applied them to self-storage, uh, which I thought was very interesting and um, it kind of encouraging. So, so for our listeners, like, you don't have to completely reinvent yourself from scratch every single time. In, in each reinvention, uh, there's an evolutionary process where you're taking what you've learned. And, and I bet you, man, he, we didn't even talk about this, but I bet you there's things he learned from his physical therapy career that he applied mm -hmm. to rentals. And then he took what he learned from rentals and applied it to self-storage. So for everybody listening, what I heard him say is like, hey, wherever you are now, you're building skills, you're, burning, you're, you're, you're building experience, you're building knowledge about certain things that you can take with you and move forward. It was really cool. I thought it was really cool. Yeah, I mean, I have some few takeaways from this particular episode too. And the first one is, since it relates to you so much, right? The similar walk, what I heard from you is like, you're thinking like, man, I'm screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> like, man, oh yeah. Well, dude, he kicked my butt, man. I had 15 years of school and I, and I, yeah, and I, and that's I mean, why I, he said, yeah. oh, man, I'm Gosh. screwed up as well. Yeah, we, <laughs> we, we should not have done this interview. It's making me look really bad. No, but on the serious side of things, Few other you know, takeaways is like first one that I call this a um, just came to me. I call this like the guru syndrome, and what I mean by that is a lot of people who are out there who are following certain gurus, right? They look at them and like, wow, look what they've done. I'm not sure if I can actually achieve that. And what Mike touched on as we talked about like how the baby starts to walk, right? Gurus don't tell you the 10, 15 years before that it took for them to get to that spot. So. This episode was really beneficial, I think, for yeah. those listeners to actually see like there is all these steps that you need to take to be able to get there, right? And it gives you some ability to actually think like, man, I can do this too, you know? And that's Dude, one important thing. It's such, uh, you're so right. Like we, people, I don't know, we always look at the after. Yeah. We never look at the before, you know, and I get it because we don't see the before because these people haven't reached levels of success that, 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 that garners our attention. And so we kind of just ignore these people and maybe they're still in that crawling stage or their walking stage um, and they haven't reached their stride. And so we kind of just somehow dismiss all these challenges that people have to go through. And in Mike's case, he talks about anxiety and, and, you know, he says he wasn't, you know, a, a typical alcoholic, but he really had an issue with this and this is how he medicated himself. And so everybody has these challenges and everybody has these beginnings. Like nobody right. just wakes up and they're a great actor or they're an Olympic athlete or they're a successful real estate investor or, or let's even apply this to personal life. Nobody wakes up and they're a great parent or a spouse. You know, this, all of these things come from an evolution of growth and of the, the uh, acquisition of, of skills and the right mindset and all the things that go along with that. Yeah, I don't know if you guys can believe it, but there was a time where I couldn't say, how you doing? You know? <laughs> that, that was probably a better time. Uh, you get a different example, maybe? <laughs> no, but listen, it is true. It's so true. And the other takeaways that I've gotten out of this is when he talked about I forget the exact phrase that he used, but the, the elevation zone versus oh, the Oh, dude, that was zone. huge. So we talked about, yeah, the zone of excellence. Yeah, zone of excellence. Yep. Migrating into, yeah, dude, that was huge. That, that was huge. Huge. Now <laughs> we're going into a whole lot huge. No, the reason why I bring this up is because if I really think about it, I'm fortunate enough and grateful for the fact that I feel like I found my zone of genius, the genius zone because I get to do this every single day, right? Wake up and have conversation, be able to coach people and, and help them have breakthroughs in their life and, and live the life that they truly want to do, you know? And when you start looking for that, I think a lot of times all the challenges that happen in life, because hey, listen, it doesn't matter what path you're gonna pick in life as far as business or relationships or whatever, there will be challenges, right? But I feel like when you business, when you hit that genius zone, those challenges become a little bit easier, right? To handle 
to get through, to get to the next level. And you become more creative and become, um, I think, more equipped to handle them because there's that genius, there's the passion behind it to keep moving forward. Dude, and well, well, the, to your point also, like um, for those of you who aren't even in that level yet, you haven't reached the, the level of excellence or the zone of excellence, you haven't reached the, the genius zone, it's, it's an evolution. Yeah. Like you really got to just, and, and Mike talked about persistence and this is something you just got to kind of, you, you it, it almost draws you there. I feel like, I feel like these things are things that kind of pull you in that direction. You, you, it starts with your vision so you can kind of create with yourself. And by the way, even your vision, a lot of times when people are figuring out like what they want their lives to look like, they look back at previous experiences or moments in time where they felt energized, they felt juiced up, they felt like they were in flow right? And, and this is where um, those things start to come from. And as you start to identify those, it's a, it's a migration in that direction over time. And so you spend more time in your, in your zone of excellence. And then eventually you get to where a lot of, those, a lot of your activities in your day-to-day -day life are, are in that zone of excellence. But then you have a little bit of a breakthrough and you start to evolve and move and migrate towards your zone of, of uh, your, 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 unique, your, your unique genius zone. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I get marbles in my mouth there. And, and, um, it's not easy speaking English, is it? It, it isn't, right? Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and eventually over time, like all of your activities start moving into your genius zone and all of your things start to move from have to's to get to's. And an incredible thing happens when you make that transition and life takes on a new meaning and life takes on a new oh. significance and joy and fulfillment and passion. And everybody, I really want to emphasize this, everybody can do that. Yeah. And I, my wish for all the listeners on this particular episode, any episodes on the Life on Air show and people that are coming to interact with uh, Life on Air and all that kind of stuff is for you to be able to get to that, you know, to find that, to get to, get to the get toots. Yep. Get toots. Get toots. And it, that's right. That's right. Well, hey, that's a wrap. Listen, before we close out this session, we have something really cool and brand new. We're going to try it out and see how it goes. Uh, and that is we are going to have Mike live in the Life Inner app on Tuesday. And I'm looking at my calendar right now to make sure I say the right thing. Tuesday, June 23rd in the year's 2020, depending on when you listen to this, okay? If you, if you listen to this in 2025, it's past, all right? But listen, June 23rd, uh, Tuesday at noon Eastern to two, about two, about two hours, uh, or 11 Central to one, okay? And so this is an opportunity for you to ask Mike questions and engage with him live uh, in, in a conversation and uh, anything that you, that you want to share with him or, or ask him or, or discuss with him, this is a place to do it. He's been being interviewed and hosted by Steve Cook, the founder of Life in Air. And so I'm really excited for you to be part of this. Now, listen, if you listen to this podcast episode and that date has already passed, don't worry about it. We're still going to have the recording of that interview and of those questions available in the app. So either way, go on over to the app and, and listen to the interview with Mike, uh, whether live or the re recorded version. Now, you know, we've already been telling you like you, you have to get this life in your app. It's, uh, it's really, really cool. It's where a lot of the discussions and conversations on any and everything life in here are taking place. So you can go ahead and get that now. Uh, it's free. You can download that from your, your uh, Apple store or Google play or if you're like me, you can go use a desktop version. Simply go to lifeinner.com slash app to get that. And I hope to see you over there. Uh, thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this uh, episode and we hope to see you next week. As always, thank you for tuning in. We value your time. We hope you got something out of it and we will see you next week. <laughs>